before we get to questions, we have some <laughs> samples. This is actually a recreational show, apparently, yeah. and some new game, and we don't know the rules. Uh, <laughs> what do you have, Jim? I have a gimmick, or you might say a device, that I'm going to show here. And this is uh, an example of what's called a tennis racket bug zapper. And uh, lest you think that this is a toy or maybe just a gimmick that doesn't work, I would like to show you that it can be useful when it comes to taking vengeance out on insects or killing a few of them that are a nuisance. Okay, these things you might think aren't very powerful, but I want to demonstrate this. Essentially, it's an electrocutioner type of a device run, in, run by two um, AA batteries. And some of these can boost the voltage up to about five, two to 5,000 volts. They have a capacitor in them. So of course they're going to give a charge to any insects that lands on it. And we're not going to use an insect for an example, but we're going to use foil insects that we made. But I'm going to show this and as Lowell, I'm going to push, push this button on and I'm going to have Lowell <laughs> drop our foil insect on top. Go ahead and do it and just nice okay. and gentle. All right, all right. Okay. See, you want to try another one? Do I touch that one? No! <laughs> anyway, okay, so let's take that off and try one more. See, that it actually electrocutes <laughs> uh, insects. Now, the best value I found for this was in an office area or in some room where there's just these flies that are just a nuisance and they aren't going to settle down until you take action like with something like this. Um, possibly around a grill, you're trying to grill, you might have yellow jacket, jacket wasps or flies attracted and uh, you know essentially you got to work for the effect because you got to work on your tennis you know skills and you just simply push that button and it, it will uh, produce the voltage so you got to be real careful this says warning not a toy it says keep away from children well I'd say keep away from silly adults too they're trying to have fun with it because it, it can be very dangerous so but anyway it does have its place and so I just wanted to show that to you all Thank you, Jim. And no, that's not going to be a good Father's Day present. <laughs> All right, well, it's coming you, up. You have, you have our the bane of yeah. the landscape in your hand. I don't have electricity, but uh, I do have yellow nuts edge. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, yellow nuts edge is one of the uh, I, I guess most problematic weeds in in turf in, in Nebraska here. And uh, this is uh, coming up on campus here and. I uh, thought since most people have lots and lots of questions over this, I, I'd bring some, some of it in. Uh, you can see it's a sedge, it's, it's not a grass, it has a three-sided stem uh, on that. If you look over the top, leaves come out in, in three directions uh, on that. Uh, so post-emergence control in turf, because it's a perennial, uh, herbicide um, control is probably uh, the best option to, to try to get rid of it. And using a product like Sedge Hammer or Dismiss uh, or a combination product that has sulfentrazone in it right now uh, would be a good, good start uh, for managing that this year. They are leaping out of the ground, aren't they? They are. They are. Yeah. Good year for weeds. All right, Kevin, you have now become the king of garlic based on your last sample yeah, as well. This is true, yes, I'm the smelly garlic guy. Um, well, what I have this time is different. Um, I have a sample here of garlic that is suffering from pythium root rot. And uh, as the name implies, this disease rots the root. Um, you can see, obviously, we have a healthy root system and a not so healthy root system. Um, some of the symptoms that you need to look for um, on the above ground portions of the plant, uh, you will see the leaves um, start to become chlorotic from the tips back. Um, and it'll happen on the older and the younger leaves. Um, if there were some newer, younger leaves, you would see it on that. Um, it would be even more prevalent on that than, than the older leaves. Um, the, the roots that are uh, affected become gray and sunken. Um, they're not nice and turgid and full like a healthy root would be. So if you have these symptoms, it's a good indication that you have pythium root rot. Now, pythium is a difficult pathogen to control. It lives very well in the soil. And we've had this spring some really good soil conditions. We've had a lot of soil moisture and some cooler temperatures. So this disease, or this particular pathogen, um, this pythium fungus is kind of um, going crazy. It's, it's running like gangbusters in our soil. So um, this is uh, what it'll do to garlic. It has a very large host range. So you, might, um, you wanna watch out for any kind of seedlings or young plants that you have in the soil right now. Their root systems um, are susceptible to infection by these pythium diseases. So. In terms of control, there's not a lot you can do. Fungicides are not um, really effective. You just want to pull out any plants that's, that are affected, and you might have to plant something else there next year. 
okay. next year. A little crop rotation. Yeah. It's great. All right, thanks, Kevin. Yeah. Elizabeth, you have a bit of beauty for us. I, we go from garlic to something kind of a little bit nicer. <laughs> um, we have Calicanthus, um, also known as uh, Carolina Allspice. Um, and right now it's blooming. This is one of the, you plant it and you forget about it type of a shrub. Um, these are by Kime Hall out there, um, South Doors there, and they've been there the entire time where they did redid Kime Hall, and they're blooming um, just beautifully right now. It's a good size shrub, you know, probably around five to six foot um, range and about that wide, has arching branches. Um, when it comes to these, there's several varieties on the market or cultivars on the market now. They've got different sizes, different flower colors, um, but the seed pod on this one, it, when it fully matures, is, is really kind of fun. It makes a big old pod on the, on the stem, but um, one of those ones that you, you put it in the ground, it's really hardy, it's going to do well for you, um, and it'll look nice at this time of the year, and then those interesting seed pods later on. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. All right, Jim, you get the first set of pictures. Okay. And this is a viewer who has apples, mm -hmm. an orchard actually, so these are real ones. And they found these curled leaves and then uncurled the leaves and within the leaf, so there's the curl. Okay, sure. And then <clears throat> uncurled the leaves and found what they thought was mm -hmm. some sort of insect kind of stuff going on. All right. And wonder what it is and what they should do about it. Well, those are called woolly apple aphids because if you look real closely, uh, you'll see that they have, they actually secrete a flocculent kind of woolly material that actually helps to protect them or conceal them. Um, they can build up in real high numbers toward the end of the season. Um, on larger trees, they're not considered to be that important if they're above ground or, or they even feed on the roots of the tree as well and how they get down there, I don't know. But uh, essentially, it's the younger trees that are being planted into the landscape uh, that need to become established. If you get infestations of the aphids, especially in the roots, it can be detrimental, and that would require uh, some kind of a soil treatment with an insecticide to kill them. But usually above ground, uh, the, the trees can tolerate um, their, you might say, the damage they cause, which essentially is just a cupping of the leaves, doesn't actually kill the leaves. And then uh, usually by the time we have the, the heat of summer develop, a lot of those uh, aphids will decline in population because of natural controls and simply because it's not hospitable anymore uh, to be there. So there'll always be some in the season. They resurge again a little bit in the fall and you see them in the spring, of course. Okay, so really do nothing. Do nothing unless it's a younger tree. All right, thank you, Jim. All right, uh, Lowell, this is a viewer who sent in a picture of a dandelion. Okay. And they said that there had, they had been sprayed with 2,4-D, so apparently they've done mm -hmm, some spraying. Mm -hmm. And then they saw that curly Q thing yeah. on the bottom of it and wondered if they had caused that by the 2,4-D spraying or yeah. was that some other alien object? No, um, that can happen uh, when 2,4-D uh, or a growth, any kind of growth regulator is sprayed on, on a plant. Um, it's just abnormal uh, growth uh, there. That ha happens not only on dandelions, but uh, if, if even grasses, like uh, if corn gets too high of a dose of 2,4-D, the brace roots that develop will be fused together uh, like that. So it's kind of an interesting uh, phenomenon uh, we're getting kind of past the time to control dandelions uh, right now. Uh, spraying 2,4-D, we're getting into the hottest time of the year and to kind of avoid drift and, and uh, making applications at a better time of year for better control is, is probably the, the good idea now. But kind of interesting things that, to, that, occur. that occur with 2,4-D. All right, thank you, Lowell. All right, Kevin, you have uh, a viewer. This is a Lincoln viewer. And they have um, an oak, big oak, and they notice this growth, very mm. rapid growth of that interesting fungal thing. Yeah. And there was a apparently there was a family of squirrels in there before the fungus occurred. So mm. they're they're wondering how they treat it. What's going on? Is mm -hmm. this? Uh, Unfortunately, there's really no treatment. Um, so that's a that's a saprophytic. Fun fungus that's growing, so it, that fungus um, actually feeds on dead wood, and the inside of trees it consists of dead wood. Um, that's what supports the tree. So um, what happens is that this fungus gets in there and it, it um, metabolizes all of that dead material, that that strong, sturdy material inside the tree, and breaks it down. 
Um, when you see a fruiting body like this, uh, it really means that infection's been occurring for, for quite a while. Uh, if the tree is located above a house or above somewhere where children play or something like that, you might want to think about taking it down. I, I don't like to uh, ever advocate taking down trees, but uh, if, 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 if safety is an issue here, uh, you might want to think about cutting it down. Um, whenever you see fruiting bodies on a tree like that, it's never a good sign for the tree. All right. Thank you, Kevin, unfortunately for that viewer. All right, Elizabeth, you also have weirdness tonight. <laughs> this is a viewer in, in Utica, so Seward County, and they found a flattened asparagus shoot. They said it was one in a thousand, if that. So not, not occurring very often, and the rest of the asparagus is normal. And we'll throw it to Kevin, because I know he's been wanting to say this <laughs> all night, because he's been practicing. Well, this is a, a beautiful, it's actually a genetic disorder called fasciation. <laughs> and when this occurs in cut flowers, um, people, people pay high price for this. You could say that people have a fascination with this fantastic fasciation. So I let him say it. Um, <laughs> it's, it's one of those rare things that's one in a lot. A lot. Um, and so, you know, you've already cut it out. Uh, more than likely, it's probably not going to come back up. Um, you could probably still eat it. Um, I don't know how good the eating quality is going to be. It's not going to be very fleshy, um, but it is one of those unique, fascinating things <laughs> right, in the thank garden. Thank you. <laughs> All right, and you get the next uh, set of pictures, Jim, and, and this is uh, this is a critter of a different sort, which is, of course, the insect, and this is um, choke cherry that has these sort of growths mm -hmm. on it, and um, they, they kind of do that, and then they turn blackish. Okay. So what is so that? Have, on the leaves, I'm not quite sure that cupping of the leaf, it's possibly could be aerophyid mites, uh, possibly some aphid feeding. I'm not sure about that one, but on this, this, these choke cherries that are developing, that is caused by what is called a choke cherry midge, and it's a gall midge, and it, oh, excellent there. Um, as just after flowering or at flowering, the adult midge deposits eggs uh, on the pistil, or you know, the, at the base of the flower, um, and these uh, little maggots, of course, will hatch out and infest that developing pistol and essentially excavate it by their feeding so it's it's sterile and you'll still get some growth and swelling that will result but it will not produce any fruit of course or cherry and so essentially just kind of withers up and turns dark um, so it's usually very minimal you know and it's just more of an interesting phenomenon like the fasciation and so uh, it's really not that prevalent in most bushes or anything like that so not to worry. Not to worry, but fascinating. <laughs> That's the word of the night, apparently. Yes, yes. All right, Lowell, you had a, a, a set of images sent in by a viewer who said everything that was blue is now yellow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and the yellow has replaced everything that was, was earlier in the fields all over, uh, certainly eastern Nebraska. I don't know if it's every place. And they're wondering what it is and is there a need to control it. Yeah, so what's, what's well, there's a number of things blooming right now, but some of the bright yellow um, flowers uh, in road size, and you can see right there uh, in pastures and maybe alfalfa fields if, if folks are out in the country, uh, could quite possibly be uh, tall hedge mustard. And I think that's that's what this what this plant uh, is. Uh, before it flowers, it almost, it almost looks kind of like a hairy dandelion uh, to to a certain degree. You can see the leaves mm -hmm. there uh, with the with the jagged edges uh, on that. It's, it's in the mustard family. Uh, behaves as a uh, biennial, sometimes a winter annual. Um, came probably came up last fall, and now it's blooming here uh, in in the spring. Um, typically infests waste areas, uh, ditches. Uh, it can be a problem if it's in pastures. Um, and if folks want to control it, fall applications, simple uh, growth regulator type of herbicide would probably do a, a really good job on it. But all, all the hembit went away and now we have tall hedge mustard. All right, and again, not the time to control it. No. All right, thank you, Lowell. Yeah. All right, uh, Kevin, this is uh, a viewer who thinks they have powdery mildew maybe and they've seen it on choke cherry and they've also seen it on mm -hmm. some viburnums mm -hmm. and it just happened almost instantaneously. Yeah. They have um, powdery mildew definitely. 
Um, yes, that is a clear sign um, with the very white, fuzzy appearance that you'll get mostly on the upper side of the leaf. Um, it is definitely powdery mildew. Those two shrubs are susceptible. There's a lot of plants that are susceptible to this disease. Um, the best thing to do is to try to um, create the kind of microenvironment that's not conducive for growth. So if you can prune to increase airflow or if there's any way to um, uh, help I don't know, more sunlight come through um, and help dry the plants down a little bit. Any way you can reduce uh, the amount of relative humidity in and around the plant, you will uh, reduce the amount of disease. Um, it's not typically gonna kill your shrub, uh, but these, this particular disease likes to come back year after year. And if you have several years of repeated infection, uh, it might wear down the tree enough to where you might see some dieback. So if you keep getting this disease, um, you might want to, there, there, I think you could probably get a little bit of control with some copper-based fungicides, but um, it, sh it should be uh, easily managed with these cultural practices. The other thing too is when those leaves do drop to the ground, make sure you rake them out and remove them every fall because that's a good source of inoculum. All right, thank you, Kevin. Elizabeth, you have a viewer in Elkhorn who sent in uh, an image here and said that this particular evergreen, uh, she thought it was a yew, but I think we've decided it was, it's probably an Arbor Vita. Mm -hmm. Uh, they look great from the west side, uh, but the east side looks dead, which is kind of interesting. And, and I think her, her question here is what is the problem and is there any sort of a cure short of the cut it down, rogue it out? There's a, there's a few things that can cause that. If there was something planted right up next to it and then it got removed, um, where there wasn't any sunlight getting to those needles, those needles can turn brown. Also, you know, last year we saw a lot of drought damage on Arbor Vitae. Um, and so they are one of the more susceptible ones out there. Um, so once a tree gets to the point, and especially an evergreen tree, where there's no needles or no new growth on that location, it's not probably going to sprout new growth. So those branches that are completely dead and brown, they're not going to sprout new growth. So if you leave it in, you're still going to have a bare side and you're going to have a full side. Um, so it's up to you if you like that look or not, but removal might be a way to just try something new in that location. All right, uh, Jim, you have a viewer who called in a question from Neighbor, Nebraska, which is up in the O'Neill area. They have ponderosa pines, 20 to 30 years old. Um, they have bore holes they think, appearing in rows all the mm -hmm. way around between each tier of the branches and the tree is declining. Sap is coming out of the holes. I'd say probably, uh, the first thing is probably the tree's in poor condition in the first place. Um, secondly, the damage that you see that's in orderly fashion like that are caused by sap suckers, which are uh, woodpecker related uh, birds that actually peck little holes so that the sap starts to ooze and come out of the holes. Now for one thing, there's an advantage of that because <coughs> insects often get caught into that sap <clears throat> and so they're eating on the insects and I don't know, I think, I believe they might take up some of that sap too. But so that's an aggravating situation that needs to be taken care of. Now I, I, I think you'd have to evaluate the tree as to whether there's, you know, whether there's any need to do that or to start thinking about something, planting something else into the landscape uh, because they can do a good job of girdling um, those and you have to put hardware cloth or something around there to keep them from continuing to do that if you think that you, there's any hope for the tree in recovering. All right, thank you, Jim. Uh, let's <clears throat> see here. Lowell, you have um, a viewer in Schuyler. Okay. has a, a large iris bed that's being taken over by brome grass. Mm. Every year they pull it, comes back thicker next year. Uh, they wanna know is there anything they can do to spray that will, will take out the brome and not hurt the iris. Not hurt the iris. Right. Um, I, I assume it's, uh, it's smooth brome they're talking about and maybe downy brome. Probably both, it, I guess. It could, yeah, yeah, it could be both. Um, the, the unfortunate thing is a simple herbicide application is uh, over the top. It's, there's not really a selective way to, to take the brome out of the irises. Uh, realistically, what uh, you're looking at doing is making a, a wicking application or you can use a glove and uh, wipe uh, glyphosate or Roundup uh, on the brome grass and uh, just be cognizant that uh, it, one application is, is not gonna take care of that. It's gonna take a persistent effort of uh, applications to kind of knock the brome back in that situation. All right, and, and that really is a tough one to control pretty it, much everywhere, isn't it? It is, it is. Okay, all right, Kevin, uh, the year of the rust. 
<laughs> this is a viewer who has, um, they, they're in Saunders County, and about every year in mid-August, they develop a red rust in their bluegrass. They water early in the morning, they aerate every fall. Um, infestation seems to be worse uh, every year. The lawn recovers in the spring, but takes longer and longer and longer to, to bounce back. So they're wondering two things, one of which is a, a resistant cultivar question, and all the other is effective fungicides for rust and when you put them down. Uh, there really aren't any, unfortunately. Uh, fungicides are, are not very effective against rust and turf. Um, at least from what I know, maybe Lowell, you have a conflicting story there, but no, um, no. management practices are the best, and it seems like they're doing, you know, what they need to be doing, watering early in the morning so that it dries out. Um, if there's any other way to increase airflow um, in, in, in that particular area of the yard, that would be a good idea as well. Um, and just establishing a good fertilizer program, making sure that your turf is vigorous and healthy, um, should help to alleviate this problem. Um, unfortunately, there is no kind of chemical cure-all yeah. and then in terms of, of resistance I, I guess I'm not aware of, of resistance in, in uh, of rust in, in turf so um, it's more of a management uh, type of type of approach all right thank you gentlemen um, Elizabeth we are in an asparagus roll since it is the season this is a viewer who moved to uh, an acreage and um, they cleaned it all up and they found a patch of asparagus they they don't really say whether it is fence asparagus or whether in fact this is an older garden, but they've hand weeded. They they want to know what they should really do to to kind of restore this one and and see what happens with it. When it comes to old asparagus beds, and, and when we're talking about the fence asparagus, <coughs> those are the ones that the birds have planted. Um, that fence asparagus usually has tiny little stalks that really don't produce much in the long run. Um, if it happens to be an old garden stand, maybe it'll produce a little more, um, but it's hard to know for sure. You know, you can leave it in and let it frond out and fern out this year. See next year if you do have a little bit bigger, bigger stalks to it. Um, you could try a little bit of fertilizer, but um, you know, it, in the long run, you might be better off with a newer variety or a newer cultivar um, out there in the garden to get better production and maybe some bigger, bigger stalks out of that. All right, Jim, you get the next picture. Um, this is a viewer who lives in Kearney. They have a pine, they think it's a scotch, 30 plus years old, die back on the lower branches. She's seen these elements. Um, she's also, um, and she's taken some great pictures of this. Yes, she has. Thinks they have the black spots and they're wondering is it pine scale or tip blight or both. So I think Kevin can pipe in on this too. But sure. I, uh, if you have heavy infestations of those white specks, which are actually pine needle scale, uh, that can uh, cause a little bit of die back or stress on those uh, branches on which they're infesting. This is a good time, by the way, to be treating for pine needle scale. It's, it's when Spirea van Hootie, that bridal wreath uh, bush is in bloom. That's a good indicator type of a plant to, to let you know it's time to treat for those pine needle scales. And something as simple as insecticidal soaps, horticultural spray oils are okay when these little crawlers are out on the, the needles trying to establish themselves. Mm. Uh, but remember, avoid oils for spruce, uh, blue spruce. So that'll take care of them real easy. Yeah, right. and it looked like too on that sample there was some, uh, probably both Dothostroma and some um, Diplodia tip light uh, in the bottom right hand corner of that, of that picture. You could see some of the newer growth was completely dead. So it's possible you could have uh, one or even both of those um, foliar fungal diseases. Unfortunately, we've kind of missed the, the start time for, for fungicidal applications. You want to do that as soon as the candles start emerging and now they're about half to almost fully emerged. So it's a little too late to treat. Usually it doesn't um, result in tree death, but again, it'll come back again next year if you don't clear out those pine needles that drop. Um, so repeat infection can take a toll on the tree after several years. All right, thank you gentlemen. Lowell, you get the next picture. This is a viewer who said they spot sprayed their yard with tenacity mm -hmm. and saw some effect on the brome grass, um, kind of that silvering, and wonder um, can, they, can they expect that control and suppression based on this picture? Um, 
So tenacity, uh, how it works is it inhibits uh, pigment formation uh, in a plant. And some grasses are more susceptible uh, to uh, phytotoxicity from tenacity than, than others. That's why we get uh, control of crabgrass uh, with mm -hmm. that, and it doesn't hurt our, our bluegrass or, or fescue lawns. Now, in terms of uh, the smooth brome there, um, we don't have any data that would suggest that tenacity is going to control it. Uh, there are a number of species that you will see that whitening, but it can be temporary uh, on that. Um, I, I believe Zach Riker is actually uh, has a couple studies uh, mm -hmm. looking at that, so we may actually have some data on that uh, here in the future. But uh, as of uh, to expect multiple applications to control that, um, that smooth brome there, um, I, I guess at this point I, I, would, I would doubt that it would. All right, thanks Lowell. Okay. Kevin, this is um, a viewer in Elkhorn that has Husker Red Penstemon, mm -hmm. one of Dale Lindgren's Penstemons, but it has spots on the leaves and the leaves then turn dark mm -hmm. and die mm -hmm. and fall off and whatever this is, it comes back every year. Mm -hmm. uh, she is doing wood chips around them, fertilizer with preen in it and also a weed preventer. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, all those cultural practices seem to be fine. It, to me, it looks like some kind of a foliar pathogen, whether it's bacterial or fungal, is hard to determine from the picture, but um, <clears throat> it's definitely some kind of pathogen that's residing in uh, the dead tissue because, uh, as you can see in that picture, only the lower leaves were affected, and that's a good indication that you have something that's surviving the winters uh, in the debris, in the plant debris that was infected last year, that's laying on or in the soil. Um, so when those guys come back again in the spring, uh, it rains and all of those spores or, or the bacteria get splashed up onto those leaves and cause reinfection. So you wanna make sure um, that you clean out any of the dead or blighted leaves every year and that should help reduce the inoculum quite a bit. You should stop seeing the disease. Um, and I wonder about the mulch <coughs> since it's something that's pretty pretty drought resistant usually, Elizabeth? It depends on how thick the mulch right. is. I mean, you're looking at two to three inches of mulch being optimal. So if you have more mulch than that, or if the mulch is too high on the crown of the plant too, um, that can cause some issues too. All right, thanks. Um, Elizabeth, you have an ID question from a viewer who has shrubs mm -hmm. that are in full bloom right now and they, he wonders what they are. Um, Pretty. Those are a honeysuckle. Those are like the Tatarian honeysuckle, the, the shrub. Um, and these ones are really nice. Um, they do make a bright red fruit that is not edible um, or not palatable. We'll say it that way. But it is susceptible to the aphid. Yeah. And what it causes is a big old witch's broom at the ends where the aphids do their feeding. Um, it's unsightly, doesn't look very pretty, um, so most of the time it needs to be kind of pruned out or yeah. kind of taken out. All right, Jim, uh, you get an image, and, and this may or may not fall to you. This might end up on Kevin's plate again, or, or maybe we're going to scratch our heads. Let's fight for it. Oh, let's do. This is a viewer in Central City, and this is a sweet potato vine, and she said there's this hard substance on the veins that starts out light colored and then eventually turns mm -hmm. black. The leaves wilt and die, and she wonders if it's an insect. And I think there might be a few things involved here. I don't see that this is insect. I thought at first of all, maybe aphids, but it doesn't look like insect at all. Um, I I think what we're looking at, you're suggest I'm su suggesting it maybe an edema. To right, with. right. Um, so the fact that it starts off green makes me think that it's just a proliferation of plant tissue, um, which is called edema. It's usually caused by um, super high humidities. Um, excessive which, wetness. Except, uh, excessive yeah. wetness in the soil as well. Um, the only other thing I could think of too, except she said it was a hardened mass, is sometimes you'll get aphid feeding and they'll release that sugary exudate from their, mm -hmm. from their cornicles and then you'll have, um, you'll have fungi that'll grow on that sugary, sugary substrate on the leaf surface. But she said it was a hardened mass, so my, my best guess is edema. Stop watering. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's see, Lowell, you get the next image and I believe this one is of an interesting weed, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. This is growing obviously in a sort of a gravelly edge mm -hmm. of a sidewalk yeah. and showing up kind of all over right now. It's kind of pretty and people want to know what it is and what you sh should you do about it. Yeah, that's uh, yellow wood sorrel. It is actually a, a perennial, uh, has uh, stolons 
and it's a broadleaf. It's uh, characteristic, uh, little yellow flowers, bright yellow flowers on that. And the, it's a trifoliate leaf, and the leaflets are, are actually heart-shaped uh, on that. Um, <clears throat> it's, it, it, it doesn't survive mowing very well. Um, and in terms of herbicides uh, or herbicide control, uh, persistent applications uh, with, with a growth regulator herbicides can, can be effective, but in landscape situations like you were looking there at in that picture there, um, some glyphosate or just simply uh, hand removal is the easiest way to, to get rid of it. And is this the one that shoots its seeds a long ways? I, 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 it, this one could, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it has a, um, it's almost like a, a banana shaped seed pot uh, on it. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. Okay, thanks Lowell. Kevin, Spruce. Oh, poor Spruce. <laughs> From two different locations, uh, so we have a, a couple of sets of pictures. This is actually uh, here in Lincoln, uh, 20 years old, started having dead areas in the top last year. Mm -hmm that have been spreading down. They've fertilized and sprayed and root watered on this. They wonder if it's uh, salvageable. And then the second set is from Shadron and, and they have been in severe drought, but they're wondering is this drought damage or is mm -hmm. this something else? Well. Um, since we got the second picture up, we can talk about that first. Um, most likely it's just drought. Um, I've been getting spruce after spruce into the, into the clinic and I've been searching them high and low for any signs of insect damage or disease and I just haven't found anything. Um, so what, what that could be, because I see that the tips of that, that second picture of the plant, the tips of the needles, the very newest needles were green and then the older needles were brown. If you have something that looks like that, it's possible that it's a, a foliar fungal disease called rhizosphera needle cast and just like the name implies it casts those needles usually on the inside of the plant. Um, however, if you pick up any of those needles that are cast, you'll be able to see on the needles, if you have a hand lens, um, the black fruiting bodies that that fungus produces. So if, if the black fruiting bodies are there, um, then you have you probably have, it's a good indication that you have this rhizosphera um, and that is treatable. We've passed that window to treat, um, but that particular one is treatable. If you don't see the, the black fruiting bodies, it's probably just drought. And then concerning that first picture with the top, um, you know, two or three feet of the tree dying back, yeah, there it is again. Um, Three things are possible, cytospora canker, um, some kind of an insect bore, and winter injury or drought stress. And again, um, I've been seeing this all across the state. I have not seen um, insect damage on the stems that come in. I have found um, only one sample that actually had the canker, the fungal canker. Um, so I, I believe that this is just a drought stress condition. And a lot of people say to me, well, Kevin, I watered. I gave it supplemental watering last year. It might not have been enough. I mean, the drought we had was very, very severe, and we had you know six feet of the soil that was completely bone dry. So the supplemental watering may not have been enough. And that's what we're seeing is just drought stress. All right, thank you, Kevin. That first picture, it's not going to get any taller. Right. It's going it's right. to it's gonna make right. a little puff. So that's the thing to keep in mind is you're not going to have a nice Christmas tree shape on that one right. anymore. A little puff tree. <laughs> All right, and speaking of tree issues, um, this is a viewer with river birch, Elizabeth. Uh, west facing, um, they did water with a soaker hose, and this is in Gretna, backyard faces west, heavy wind. The question is simply, should she prune back to that growth and give it a start over again, or should they have it removed and replaced? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, the problem with river birch in a lot of locations, it's, it's just not suited for some of those locations. It's got river in the name because it likes it a little bit moister, and it is susceptible to several insects, um, and it is susceptible to chlorosis as well. Um, so in that location where you only have a little puff, even if you leave it there, you, the tree itself might not live for very long. Um, so if you wanted to, to think about possibly some replacements for come fall, if the tree doesn't survive throughout the summer, that might be a good option. Jim, uh, we're almost out of time, but we have uh, a couple of grub questions already. Uh, one of them is grubs in the planting beds and more and more brown patches in the turf. Um, tried to pull the, the roots up and couldn't pull them up. That's in Valley. And the other one, his backyard is full of large brown spots and two-inch grubs, six per square foot. So 
Not sure what should be yeah, happening Yeah, I commend yet. them for just the detail of information yeah. they provided there. Yeah. But I would say uh, probably the turf issues are separate from the grubs. Uh, the grubs right now have reached maturity. They're mostly probably already pupating to change into the mass chafer beetles. And so they, they don't feed very much. We've had ample rainfall and everything to keep the grass growing really well. So don't worry about the grubs. They will soon pass the scene. As far as the patches in the lawn, uh, there could be any number of reasons for that. Yeah, starting with drought to begin with. Right, yeah. from last year. All right, speaking of, of uh, dying turf, yes. well, you'll probably get the last quick question. Okay. This is zoysia burned oh. badly by summer heat and drought, only a few small spots left. Nothing else grows there except the dandelions. Anything they can do to save it short of stripping it off and seeding or sodding? Um, you, you, well, we're, it's a warm season grass. Uh, it, if it was gonna warm up, it should do that very quickly or green up. Um, if not, um, starting over and selecting a new uh, improved variety of a desirable turf is probably the best way to go. All right, and you sort of avoided the question of whether in your mind zoysia is a that's, desirable That's for rock turf. and, and, and sabotage a possibility. Yeah. 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 Is it some of the zoysia lawn? <laughs> yeah, somebody went around with a roundup on those, didn't they? <laughs>